wi- weekends go out the window saying, okay, well, uh, you know, evenings uh, are for me. Not always. If, you've, if you're really under the gun, you've got to give up all that time too. So you lose a lot of time to this job. Uh, when when the work comes in, you lose the time. You lose a lot of time for doing anything else. Um, other things um, involve uh, mostly it's mostly on a social level, but other and but other things can also include you know some of my own interests uh, on the side, things I like to do. I like to read. Uh, you know, I like to you know. Go out and get walking in sometimes. You know, little things that everyone has their own little interest. And when this kind of th- work comes in, oftentimes I have to shelve all of that. Well, there's a good book I like I want to pour into. Well, it's just going to have to wait for a month because I'll be for the next month lost in this. Uh, you lose a lot of you time uh, to this job. But you also get to put that you time what you would, the time you would be spending on you, you pour the, all that you-ness into the... Oh, piece. exactly. That's it. It's just being channeled somewhere else. But uh, the problem is oftentimes is that there's a lot of things out there that the world demands of you or asks of you. And at the same time, this project, this music is asking all of you at the same time. So sometimes you can be caught in like a tug of war. Uh, you know, you've got to keep up with the daily ongoings of life. And yet you still have to spend all this time in the studio. Oftentimes you can forget you can forget that the world is happening around you out there. Like I've, I've had that happen where I go into the studio for nine in the morning and I look up and it's dark outside and I'm wondering where the heck did the day go? Uh, and so you have to be careful that, you know, your things don't slip by you. You can get lost in your work. So that's, uh, that's essentially the, the predominant, uh, well, I guess the predominant thought behind, you know, what what kind of obstacles you've you've experienced. There's also the fact there's no, there's not always work. That's it. That's the other two thing as well. There's not always work. It's not a steady field. Um, work is often sparse. Uh, most composers, even the big film composers of today, um, usually only take on about maybe two scores a year at most. Um, partially because it is that taxing. Uh, you spend anywhere from a month to two months just going crazy trying to get all this work done and oftentimes you need a breather afterwards but the other reason also is just simply that if you kept yourself going at that pace like you were doing five six seven contracts in a year uh you would probably suffer burnout because you can't spend 10 hours 12 hours every day seven days a week locked away for 365 days a year it's just that's uh that's just an insane pace to keep so um so, yeah, usually um, you have to keep it like maybe one or two contracts a year, but that doesn't always come in. That kind of uh, – that we're talking here about the big film composers and even smaller time film composers. They're lucky often if they get one a year. Um, and sometimes you might even have several months go by where you're just spending your time networking and you're wondering where your next project's going to come in uh, that will continue to further your career. Mm-hmm. Uh, lots of times artists, you know, people that are in the artistic field have a hard time with parents' family. We spoke about that earlier in your mm. f- family. Actually, th- there was a period where they were wondering, right? Well, they were in the beginning when I first approached them about this because you have to keep in mind when I f- first announced that I was going to get into this, I got, I got into this very late in life. It wasn't like I was a musical prodigy from the age of five on and playing, you know, Mozart at the age of nine or where I got it. I was always into music, but not on that serious a level until late, very late, much later in life, you know? And so when I suddenly approached my family and say, well, I'm completely changing paths, you know, I'm going into music. Obviously there's some hesitancy there because you know, they're wondering, well, can he make a living off of this? You know, cause they care. Um, is he going to be okay with this? But since I've applied myself to it and worked hard at it, uh, getting contracts and, uh, actually getting results, uh, to further my career, it they they are quite supportive uh, now, um, and they have been actually for many years. Okay, well, we are running slowly out of time. Okay, if we could maybe, if you could maybe bring up a couple of points of maybe suggestions for people out there listening, if there's any you know aspiring composers, right. film composers, things that they should right. look out for. Okay, well, the first thing, and this is very important, uh, a lot of. Composers. I'm going to be targeting here specifically if you're a 20-year-old, 20-something person in university doing your music degree, or maybe you've just finished putting together a high-end studio and you're seriously considering going into 
film composition. Okay, so the rest of you, you can go take a, <laughs> take a glass of water. I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> just no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm just targeting that general area because it's a long road. That's the first thing. Uh, don't give up on it if you are seriously interested in it. Um, I know a very good film composer who's actually been in it a long time now by the name of Chris Crilly. He actually also lives here in Montreal. Uh, has won awards, um, big awards, done a lot of film scoring here in Canada. And he actually told me, um, and it's good advice, he said, do not expect to make a secure living at this before the age minimum of 35, unless you just completely fluke out and you get, um, you know, a, this uh, by accident, this movie that just gets picked up by a distributor and, you know, goes on to be you know, a big hit. And with, that's, a, that's a fluke. That's the one in the million. The, horseshoe. The, you know, that's the horseshoe. The real, the reality is for most uh, film composers, it's a long road. Uh, you rarely see any film composers who are under the age of 30. Most of them are actually over the age of 40, the ones that are actually successful and continuing doing it. Uh, so you have to be willing to stick it out. Um, the other thing that I would uh, give advice on is not to bother targeting uh, established, well-established producers and directors. And a lot of composers find this kind of confusing. Uh, they wonder why. Well, it's because... <clears throat> The entertainment industry is probably the highest risk industry for turning over a dollar, for turning over end results of making profit. And as a result of that, they are all concerned about minimizing the risks as much as possible. And one of the ways that they go about doing that is the directors, when they're hired by producers, okay, we want you to make a film, they have a core team that they rely on heavily that are key players, uh, the director of photography, the editor, and also one of them is the film composer. These are people that they know that have done good work from the past that has generated results to help further their career. And because of that, they keep going back to these people time and time again. If you want proof of that, you just have to look at the people who are in the industry. Tim Burton always works very heavily with Danny Elfman. Steven Spielberg almost always exclusively, almost all the time with John Williams. Uh, you know, uh, M. Night Shyamalan. Amelin, who's just come out recently in the scene, in the, in the movie scene, all three of his major movies have been all done by the same score, James Newton Howard. And that's just how it always works. So is no point in frustrating yourself by saying, once you get out, you're going to stri strive out there, say, oh, I'm going to go and uh, bowl over Steven Spielberg with my work. It's not that your work isn't necessarily good enough. It's just that he has his established team that he knows he can rely on time and time again. And he, for that reason, you're not going, you're going to be turned down almost a uh, hundred percent guarantee, uh, not to be discouraging. What you do instead is you go out there and find up and coming film directors, as many as you can get as many, go to film schools, whether it's same film institutes, other universities, find as many as you can that are up and coming and say that you'll be willing to work on their projects. Also be understanding the beginning that because these are up and coming, they may not be able to pay you in the beginning. Uh, you have to be willing to be flexible about that and why you'd have to maybe have another job to support yourself while you're doing it. And work with them. And if you I, and eventually, hopefully, if you get a lot of these directors under your belt that you're working with, hopefully along the way, as the years go on, one or two of these might actually break through that ceiling to continue on. And if they've liked your work and you've really done good work for them and you've had a good working relationship, they'll take you along with them. Great words of wisdom from Matthew Binks here on uh, Frank Talks Pleasures and Lifestyles. Uh, well, unfortunately, that is the end of the show. Thank you so much for being with us in studio tonight, my, Matthew. My, my pleasure. Frank Talks is sponsored in part by Everything Out of Her Mouth is a Test, a man's guide to the emotional needs of women. What would your life be like if you knew exactly what to say and do with women? This book is for the guy that simply wants to learn how to handle women's tests by addressing her emotional needs. By this, you create the type of attraction that will make her see you as the one she was destined to be with. This book will teach you how to get the woman you want and how to keep her. Everything Out of her mouth is a test is the Rosetta Stone for men to understand exactly what a woman means when she speaks and how to respond. Is that worth changing your life forever? Buy this book at franktalks.com now.